For the past few years, we've preceded our conference panel sessions with keynote conversations. These are conceived of as dialogues between two individuals on a comic topic or idea, but varying in methodology, projects, and outlets. Today, we're honored to have art historian Ruth Phillips and artist Skawanadi with us, offering their visionary perspectives on indigenous creativity, past and present. Ruth Phillips is Canada Research Professor and Professor of Art History at Carleton University in Ottawa. She's originally trained as an Africanist, and her doctoral field work led to her first book, Representing Women, Sand Day Masquerades of the Mende in Sierra Leone in 1995, which I can attest remains an important work in the field. Phillips' subsequent work has focused on the indigenous arts of North America and includes trading identities, the souvenir and native North American art from the Northeast, and with Janet Catherine Burlow, Native North American Art, 2015. As director of the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology from 1997 to 2002, she initiated a major renewal and redesign of the museum's physical and virtual research infrastructure to support collaborative work with originating communities. Her book, Museum Pieces, Toward the Indigenization of Canadian Museums in 2011, which I highly recommend, reflects on her curatorial and museum work projects through the lens of critical museo museology. As Canada Research Chair, Phillips founded the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Cultures, and together with colleagues in Indigenous communities, museums, and universities, continues to develop its shared database as a repository of multiple cultural and disciplinary knowledges. Phillips is also co-organizers of the Multiple Modernisms Project on Global Indigenous Modernisms and co-editor with Elizabeth Harney of its first edited volume, which is forthcoming from Duke University Press. She has been awarded Ontario's Premier Discovery Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Council for Museum Anthropology, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and has served as president of the International Committee on the History of Art. Skawanadi makes art that addresses history, the future, and change from an indigenous perspective. Best known for her machinimas, movies made in virtual environments, she also produces still images, sculpture, and textile works. Her pioneering new media projects include the online chat space and mixed reality event Cyber Pow Wow from 1997 to 2004, <clears throat> a paper doll slash time travel journal, Imagining Indians in the 25th Century, 2001, and also Time Traveler between 2008 and 2013, which was a multi-platform project featuring nine Machima episodes. These have been presented in New Zealand, Hawaii, Ireland, and across North America. Her award-winning work is also included in both public and private collections. Born in Janawiga territory, Skawanadi holds a BFA from Concordia University in Montreal, where she is based. She is co-director with Jason Lewis of Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or ABTEC, a research network of artists, academics, and technologists investigating and creating and critiquing ind indigenous virtual environments. She also co-directs their skins workshops in Aboriginal storytelling and digital media. In 2015, Abtech launched I, the, indigenous, the in, Initiative for Indigenous Futures, and Skawanadi is its partnership coordinator. Please joining me in welcoming Ruth Phillips and Skawanadi. Good morning, everyone. This is on, I assume. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I have to thank the association for this invitation, which is a tremendous honor, but also because it was the occasion for really getting to know Skawanadi, or beginning to get to know you, even though I'd known her work for a long time. We never really engaged with each other. And 
It's just been tremendously exciting and it's made a lot of difference to the way I uh, am able to think about my own work. So, thank you. So, um, okay, I'm technologically challenged, so getting to know Skawinati is even more <laughs> stimulating since she is not. But um, we, we began a dialogue through conversation, which we'll now continue together with all of you. And I'd like to just begin by asking you, Skawinati, to tell us about your work. Thank you, Ruth. And I think, do you need this? Yeah. All right, so is it just sort of, go ahead. So uh, first of all, this word is skana, which is another greeting in Ganyangeha, or one of the Haudenosaunee languages, and it means peace. And uh, I wanted to start by also thanking uh, the people who made it possible for me to come here, uh, for inviting me, Judith and Krista, and um, thank you, Nadine, for that beautiful welcome, my friend. Uh, and thanks, Ruth. Yeah, it's, it's been... It's been really nice to meet you. Yeah, and uh, like she said, we, I never knew her. They, you know, they paired us up. I was like, oh, I don't know this lady. <laughs> What's it gonna be like? But yeah, she came to visit me in my studio. We had like a really nice conversation and we were, you know, we were nervous, I think, both of us about doing this, but uh, finally we were like, wow, we can't shut up. So we're, I think we'll be okay. So we decided I would start uh, by, by showing you some of my work because I figure from how Krista pronounced machinima that you might, a lot of you might not know what it is. So you really have to see what I do to know what it is. But uh, let me, I think I, oh yeah, I want to tell you a tiny bit more about myself. Uh, I'm from the Turtle Clan. And my community is called Gahnawage, and it is very close by. It's a, on a good day, it's like a 15-minute drive to the, to the South Shore. For those of you who might not know, Montreal is an island. And uh, so you cross the Fleuve Saint Laurent to get to our community, which is, yeah, called Gahnawage. And uh, the nation is the Ganyange Haga, which is, in our language, Mohawk. So there's a, few, there's a few communities of Mohawks. And then the Mohawks are one of five, well, six uh, nations of the Haudenosaunee, or better known still as the Iroquois. So I'll just give you a little sort of history lesson, or more like, I guess it's, what is that, geography? So, so anyway. Uh, you heard about ad tech already, so I'm not going to spend too much time, uh, because I forgot it was in my bio, but I thought it would be nice if you saw the logo. And the Initiative for Indigenous Futures and skins, which, is, which I'm really proud of. It's, it's a, as, as, as it said, you know, it's a workshop series. Uh, we, do, we teach native youth how to make video games and make machinima, and we're also even starting to do other kinds of workshops with them as well. And I, I mean, I'm actually going there and working with young people, and I really enjoy it, although they're also annoying sometimes, <laughs> as some of you who know young people might know. So what's my, so today I'm, I'm just talking to you from my art practice point of view, and really I think what I'm doing is asking this, trying to answer this question. Can the very act of imagining the future create it? That's what I'm hoping that's mostly a yes. So the first time I actively tried to imagine the future was in the year 2000, I mean through my artwork. I've been a sci-fi fan all my life, and not just Star Trek, <laughs> but um, you know, l literature and other TV shows and movies as well. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed, I mean, this feels like kind of obvious now, but a, a sort of, it took me to about my, probably my 20s before I noticed that the future never really had any brown people in it. And so that, you know, started, that started to make me really wonder, like, why was that? And uh, where are we? And, you know, I thought, well, as an artist and a lover of sci-fi and a non-white you know, non person, maybe that's what I could do. Maybe I could start providing some visuals of us in the future, because who else was going to do it? So there's, um, this is uh, one image from the piece Imagining Indians in the 25th Century, and that piece centers around a, uh, a woman, a young woman from our present, well, from the year 2000 at that point, and uh, she, in, an un, you know, in an unexplained way, she's able to travel through history. But what I did was I 
it was for a, it was, this was a, this piece was commissioned for a millennium show uh, in Edmonton, and so I wanted her to travel through one millennium of history. Uh, and, but I, so I started the history in 1490, two years before the arrival of Columbus to the so-called New World, and I ended it in 2490, so that I was able to create some, some future uh, stops on her trip. And for each stop on her trip, she has an appropriate, uh, historically appropriate costume, and she uh, has a journal entry so that she can describe what she sort of sees and thinks about that particular time and place. So, of course, you know, I could talk about it for ages, but I won't. So I also actually am not sure how to pronounce machinima <laughs> because I only had ever read it, but, you know, it's supposed, supposedly made up of these two words, machine and cinema, so I say machinima and it's making movies in virtual spaces, and so like a video game. And so I think uh, I'm gonna start off by showing you one of these, yeah. So the first one I made was, uh, was a nine-part series mentioned uh, in my bio, Time Traveler TM, and uh, it, I created it, I started working on this in probably 2007. The first episode took me almost two years to make because uh, there's no manual for how to make machinima, <laughs> and, uh, Excuse me, it took me a long time to figure out how to do it. So I'm just going to show you this, and uh, maybe, Ruth, you can let me know if I should have given them more of an intro or something. Okay, so take it away, Lucy. Welcome, you beautiful Aboriginal people. Welcome. Welcome to the Manitowabi Powwow 2112. And for all of you watching on the net, we are broadcasting, nearcasting, and podcasting live from the Winnipeg Olympic Stadium. Did he just say 2112? My name is Luke Midawasti, and I am absolutely honored to be your host this weekend. We have so much in store for you today and tomorrow. You will witness some of the best drumming and dancing in the galaxy. Tonight, after the competition, treat yourself to a concert of cutting-edge music featuring the most notorious FN punk band ever, the famous Dead Mohawks. Famous Dead Mohawks? That's pretty funny, actually. And tomorrow night, it's time to trade in your moccasins for some Manolo Blahniks and come to the fabulous Manitowabi Fashion Show, featuring all the heavy hitters, Dorothy Grant, Chanel, Tammy Boba, and more. You are going to get a sneak peek into all of next season's regalia collections. I won't give away too much, but I do have three words for you. Personal strobe lights. Look at all those beautiful jingle dancers. Hey, I'm on screen. Our dancers are competing for some incredible prizes. Not only does every dancer get a free eyewear implant just for participating, but we're also giving away a space cruise to Saturn's rings, his and hers matching Ferraris, and $1 billion in cold hard cash. I wish I was a better jingle dancer. And now, allow me to introduce our stunning head female dancer, who was featured on the cover of Italian Vogue this month, hailing from the Cree Nation and just winding up her reign as Miss Universe 2111, Amethyst Star Blanket. I wonder if Hunter's here. It's good to see you all here, all together, you beautiful people. Do you know, my grandmother told me at one time, her grandmother told her the power was outlawed. They didn't want us Indians to get together in public. They didn't want us to get together because we'd talk. We'd plan. So, what did we do? We got together in private. We got busy. 
as record numbers of Indian babies were born in the 21st century, the powwow grew and thrived with more dancers, singers, and drummers, bigger shows, larger audiences, and worldwide broadcast rights. So yeah, I'm not sure if I gave it a really good setup. <laughs> the, so I, you know, I, um, I hadn't seen that one. I've seen Time Travelers. That's not part of that, though. Yeah, is, yeah that's, it is. Okay, it's well, part of episode four. Didn't see that episode. I saw other ones. But when I first saw them, way before I met you, I, I was truly uh, galvanized, is all I can think of to say, by the... Um, the one I remember particularly is one in which you had uh, young, two teenagers, a boy and a girl, who are visiting 17th century Ganawage and seeing the death of the great now saint, uh, Kateri Tekakwita, who com came from Ganawage and uh, uh, is buried there, right? Yeah. So it's been a great pilgrimage site for native people from all over North America for many, many years. And um, it never had occurred to me to uh, sort of to try and mix up temporalities the way you do. I mean, I'm an art historian, so I'm trained to think really in a linear way. And uh, should I put show my my ones now, or do you have a? I a have a bunch one? more. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I wasn't sure how yeah. many uh, sequence, but you know that that is a, a great place to begin. But we should see the rest of okay, yeah, of the ones. So I guess I just I think I maybe should have said that Time Traveler TM to me is like the brother piece of uh, imagining Indians in the 25th century. It's like, and to, it's also like imagining Indians on testosterone, because it's sort of like bigger, you know, it's like instead of 2D, it's 3D, it's moving, it's got like just all kinds of things going on. Uh, and so, but, in, and in this one, it's explained how the, so it, it's, this one's centered around a, a male protagonist, ma mostly, and then this female comes in, Karakohawi, who you start, who just starts taking over the story, actually. But uh, the, they both have access to this pair of glasses that's a technology of the future and are able to use it to, to visit basically events of significance to First Nations uh, throughout history. So they're all on my website, skawanadi.com, and you can watch all nine episodes there. Um, so the reason, and for those of you who might not be familiar with it, I make all my machinima in this one video game. Some people call it a game. I, I don't actually think of it as a game, but it's a virtual world called Second Life. It's technically a massively multiplayer online 3D world. And um, it's, the reason I've chosen it is because to me, when I saw Second Life, I thought I was looking at the future. I was like, what medium can represent the future better than this place where we're jetpacking already, you know? We can be the person we want to be. We can be the gender, the color, you know, have the crazy hair we want. And, uh, you know, talk to people across the world in real time. But you were a real pioneer because, you know, now I see my grandchildren doing things like this and it, they can make virtual... Uh, they, they play games on the computer where they can make little worlds. But at the time that you were doing this, it, as you were saying, the technology was really very difficult. Yeah, it, so. you, you had to... I mean, Second Life itself was built to be that way, but you, you had, there was a learning curve. There still is. So, yeah. The, the adaptations you had to do, because you spoke about that to me in the lab. Yeah. There, it, presumably it was designed not to represent indigenous people or yeah. any of the, the materialities that you want to show. So if you, you know, in this, in this uh, by this time, episode four, there was all different color skins. Um, and there were different skin colors when I first started, but the darkest skin I could get was basically the color of, the, of Garakohawi, the girl in the purple. I mean, it's Hunter, Hunter, the main character, his skin color was the darkest at the time. And, you know, and it was pretty funny because you could get these different default skins, you know, and they would have, like, you know, these, these white to medium brown people, and then they'd have, like, elves, <laughs> you know, and, then like, like the, those, that's the kind of people that they were talking to. They were talking to, you know, this was Silicon Valley where they were making this, so it was just this very white place and a fantasy place. Like, therefore, there were elves. 
Um, so yeah, but um, we've been, and I work with a team. I, I sit, like my, uh, my studio is within Concordia University and my partner, Jason Lewis, is a professor in computation arts. And so I have, um, I get to use, it sounds so terrible, <laughs> and hopefully not exploit, but the amazing, talented students that he, he has. And uh, they come and they learn how to use Second Life and they already know a lot of stuff too and they help me to realize these visions. And so the next one I wanna show you is, um, is called She Falls for Ages. Uh, this will be a, sh a, a shorter clip, but I wanted to talk about um, well, what that is and why, you know, I think it shows you the potential of what you can do with Second Life as well. So I was, I wanted to do a few things with She Falls for Ages. It is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee creation story. And for those of you who don't know that story, because you're not going to get to see it all now, the shortest per way I can probably tell it is that a, a pregnant woman living in Sky World falls through a hole to a earth covered in water and is helped by some birds to land on the back of a turtle where she is able to plant. With the, help, with the help of some water animals, actually, who get her some earth, she's able to plant and start the new world. I wanted to imagine Sky World very differently. It's usually depicted as a, a you know, def in the sky somewhere, but like pre-contact Iroquois, so still with the, lo you know, long houses made of bark, uh, clothing made of skins, pots made of clay. I really wanted it to be like another planet and a very, what we call, futuristic planet. Uh, and so I was able to do that, I think. I wanted to imagine a post-race world. Uh, and so you'll see what I tried to do there, and you can d judge, you, you know, when you watch it online later, you'll be able to judge for yourself if you think I succeeded in that. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think I'll just show you the clip now, and, and uh, is there gonna be time for questions afterwards? I forget. Anyway, you, I'm around, so you can ask me questions later. So please press play. Once upon a time, in a place far, far away, there is a girl named Otsitsakaim. In your language, that means ancient flower. And you will see how very fitting her name is. Otsitsakaim has a twin brother, the Hahumzi Sumkwa. Ista, tell us why we don't go to school like other kids. My loves, I have told you a million times, it is because of your amazing powers. Not everyone in Garunghyage has powers like yours. Otsitsakaim, you can read people's thoughts. What's it like in your head right now? It's like I'm watching three movies at once. What I see in here, what you see in here, and what my brother sees in here. Right now, they're all pretty much the same, but when we are all doing different things, it's weird. And what do you think it would be like in a classroom with a bunch of other kids? I don't know if I could concentrate. Exactly. And Dehahunsi Tsunkwa, you have the power to move things with your mind. And still you don't pick up your toys. <laughs> Thank you. But imagine you decided to do that to a real person. People would be very afraid of you. So afraid that they might want to take you away from us. You kids need to be kept apart from other people until you can learn how to use your powers wisely. How do we even get these powers, Ista? I don't know. Maybe because you two are twins and you are the children of a twin? I do know that when you were born, each of you had a special sign that told me that you would be different. Dehahunsi Tsunkwa, you were born with your amazing birthmark, just like my brothers. And Ozitsugayo, you were born with the amniotic sac still around you. It looked like a veil. Visitor approaching. Allow entry. Yes. Greetings. Kids, you finally get to meet your uncle. Rade Zerunches, this is Dehahumsi Tsunkwa.
<laughs> and this is Odita Gayo. Come and say hello, sweetheart. Hello. Yes. Well, this one is a picture of you. I saw what you looked like in Maista's thoughts. Well, that is the best portrait of me anyone's ever done. So, a telekinetic and a telepath. Have you reported it to the authorities? No, just their births. Good. They need training. I was hoping you could provide them with that. Great minds think alike, then. We can take them to the facility. It has plenty of room for all four of us, and the twins can remain secluded there for as long as necessary. Let's talk about this faraway place for a moment. We sometimes call it Garumhyake. In your language, that means sky world. Its people are a peaceful race who have overcome most diseases and hardly know the meaning of death. They have harnessed geothermal, wind, and solar power, and are brilliant botanists. One of their greatest creations is the celestial tree, developed over thousands of years of careful cultivation the tree's blossoms emit light. In fact, they light the whole world. The guardian of the celestial tree is a kind and conscientious young man named Rarumrude. It is his responsibility to make sure the tree is properly cared for, and he, indeed, everyone regards this duty as an honor. So that's that clip. Um, I'm showing you one more clip. That one will only be two minutes long. I feel like I'm hogging the, but I know we planned this, planned this. <laughs> um, so the next one is uh, my most recent one. Uh, actually, She Falls for Ages was made at the beginning, well, it was finished at the beginning of 2017, and then I made another one in 2017 called The Peacemaker Returns. And that is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee Confederation story which is basically the story of the peacemaker bringing those first five nations together, the five warring nations. Uh, that piece is part of a larger exhibition, all of which was commissioned by Vox, which I think you, some of you may have gone to visit yesterday. And uh, they, every year now, this, will be that, this was the third year, they invite an artist to do an exhibition for children. So uh, clearly, it's clear why they thought of me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so the Peacemaker Returns was made mostly for kids, and so it wasn't too difficult for me to do that because all I had to do is make sure not to have any swearing or nudity. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's just play that clip, please. My name is Yodet Sa'a, and I live on Earth, usually. Our planet is united under the great law of peace. Each nation, large or small, uses this single form of government. We all live by three values, respect, unity, and peace. Respect means that we treat every person with courtesy, kindness and acceptance. Unity is the understanding that there is power when we agree to work together. And peace is the ability to live a healthy life without fear. Until recently, life on Earth had been very good. Every Earthling had clean air and water, nutritious food, and was equally safe from harm. With our basic needs met, we were able to turn our attention to the great problems that faced our planet. And, obviously, we figured out deep space travel. 
We have now been in contact with dozens of other life forms across the galaxy. It has been amazing. And sometimes very scary. Some life forms are not interested in respect, unity, or peace. Earth has been attacked by more than one visitor from outer space, and our harmonious way of life is being threatened. So for now, my home is this spaceship. We are traveling to the first meeting of the five nearest, friendliest planets in our galaxy. The goal of our mission is to create a union that will protect us from attacks and also help us share our very different knowledges. So she goes, so she goes on to, um, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> Uh, she goes on to unite these, these five, help unite these five nations, these five different races. Uh, yeah, right. She goes on to tell you the peacemaker's story. And, uh, and we see how what she's doing... Uh, mimics, but with differences, the past. So it's, I'm trying to create, yeah, playing with time again. And, and trying to create, instead of a cycle, perhaps a spiral because there's, there's similarities to history in the past, but there's new information occurring. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do in this one as well. Okay, I think I can now take over again, right? So that's me, that's how I look in cyberspace. XOX Voyager is my name, and the piece is called She is Dancing with Herself. This piece, Dancing with Myself, is me and my avatar trying to look like each other. And uh, so it's a diptych, it's six feet tall. And uh, yeah, I had to, what I had to do, because the parameters, you know, for those of you who sew, you know like how not easy it is to make a collar really stand up like that. Whereas in Second Life, it's very easy to do that. But you know, there are things that are more difficult to do in Second Life, like have a tutu. So um, it was really, it was a job to, uh, bring my two av my these two individuals to to become one and there's a few things I'm trying to do with this one is uh, self representation as an indigenous woman in cyberspace uh, what does that mean what does it look like what should it look like you know does it need to be does it need to look like anything I think yes of course but you know if cyberspace is going to be this place of you know, maybe where race isn't necessary. I mean, certainly 20 years ago, that was something people were saying, and then that got debunked. <laughs> but I'm, I'm still thinking about that stuff. Uh, and yeah, another thing people ask me a lot about is like, if I want to be my avatar. And the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, my avatar is this awesome extension of myself that helps me to go to cyberspace and visit with other people there and do other things that I can't do in this world. But yeah, I mean, I still am the one who gets to eat and do other fun stuff with my body. <laughs> um, the avatar is also, like, what is this thing, right? It's also a plaything to me. It's a thing I, you know, I can, I enjoy playing with. I, and you started with paper dolls. Yes. <laughs> So it's, I know, it's just like, I'm actually just making the same work over and over again. <laughs> no. Not quite. But no, anyway. but I mean, it's, yeah. it's interesting how I feel like the same things that interested me 20 years ago are still interesting to me now. Um, and so this one's called Generations of Play. And I was, I had actually, I, um, I love Barbie doll, okay? So <laughs> deal with it. Um, but... Uh, Barbie, I often thought of, like, Barbie was advertised as the first, if I say this wrong, it comes out wrong, but adult-sized, <laughs> adult-looking doll. Um, and, but really, I think uh, cornhusk dolls were. So for those of you who might not know, cornhusk dolls, uh, of course, are throughout the Americas, but Iroquois have a special love and affinity to them, and uh, we make... You know, cornhusk dolls have actually are not even playthings anymore, really. I'm going to show a picture of them. Great. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I always wanted to make a piece somehow equating cornhusk dolls and Barbie dolls and somehow saying, well, actually, maybe the corn Barbie was, you know, Barbie's the descendant of the cornhusk doll. But I couldn't figure it out until I made Dancing with Myself. 
And then I was like, ding, for some reason it was clear to me that if I showed my avatar uh, as the descendant of Barbie, you know, and that these three kind of like were the playthings of maybe my, my ancestors, myself, and my descendants, like it, it finally made sense as a piece. And I also, I had to make the things to photograph them, and so, uh, oh, oh, telling me to speed up. Should I try to go back? Oh no, is it on some kind of, I don't know. Yeah, here we go. I'll just talk faster. <laughs> anyway, you saw that 3D. We can go back on that if we need to talk about it. And then I, back to thinking about representing myself in cyberspace, Mariko Mori, I feel, was doing that um, a while back. She made that piece, uh, Birth of a Star, uh, when Photoshop was first coming out. And so those, those balloons hanging in the air were like a Photoshop feat. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt, and you know, she's also talking about Japanese culture in, uh, in digital spaces and what does that mean? And I just felt like there was a lot of parallel stuff yeah. happening there. So I made that piece um, of, with my avatar. And you know, in Second Life, to make a ball hanging like that is, is it's truly like two, two or three clicks. You know, you just like, you click, you, you make a sphere, you grow it, you change the color, you position it. Okay, so maybe five clicks, but you get the idea. It's really easy, and I, I thought it was like a, a fun thing to make. I, th I don't know, I thought I had like another slide or two, but maybe they're, yeah, oh well. That's okay, I showed you a lot. So, your turn. So now, now of course, I, would, I, asked, I asked, and I'm asking, and will ask, Ruth, what do you do? I do. Well, I'll start by introducing myself, which isn't something I've often done, but I think it's only right when this is a protocol that we're learning from engagement with indigenous people, it's important to know who's speaking. And I was thinking when I was walking over here that my mother grew up just a few blocks, well, not a few blocks, but you know, maybe half a kilometer from here on Hutchison Street in Montreal, the daughter of uh, Russian Jewish immigrants. And I think spent her whole life in Montreal probably in ignorance that there were any indigenous people anywhere in the area, I suspect. She never spoke about any kind of contact. My own contact, and that, so then she married my American father and moved to the States, and I remember my first contact no, that I can remember with indigenous people was when I was in grade three in a school in Westchester County, New York, when a group of indigenous people came to address a school assembly. And I can still remember what they looked like because they were wearing fringed brown colored clothing. I don't know if it was hide or what. And then we had an art contest to draw pictures of the, this is an awful story really. I tell it in the introduction <laughs> to my, but you know, I, I, I have to tell this story because I think that's so common to so many North Americans. I won the contest because I drew an Indian princess. <laughs> and I remember that it, she had a headband with a feather in it and I cut the, construction paper into a fringe, and I thought that was just fabulously clever. So I participated in this whole construction of the stereotype, um, romantic though it may have been. That was my childhood. Um, my husband and I came to Canada 50 years ago next month as Vietnam War, uh, war resistors. So I have roots in both countries. And that, I think, has also been one reason why when I decided to shift my whole research field to the Native North American field, I, I, I think I wanted to study the Northeast because that's where I had grown up. And it was also because it's a region that crosses that border. I mean, it's a continuous region. And the Haudenosaunee, more than almost any other uh, North American uh, nations, or the five, six nations, cross that border and have crossed it for political reasons uh, and Cross it continually to maintain the Confederacy. So, um, I, I, that's a sort of small biography, but um, I, what I did, and, you know, I'm an academic, so I had to give a title to this little slideshow that I have. It's impossible to avoid. Um, but I realized that uh, talking with Skawanati, so, and watching her work, uh, um, talk a little bit about the one I've just seen, the most recent one that I've just seen. Um, just stimulated a long-term concern I've had with periodization in art history. So I called this past, present, and future t uh, tenses in indigenous and other art histories. So I, this little show is kind of a response to seeing the Peacemaker Returns last week, 
the last of the three um, machinimas that you showed us a clip of. Um, and I realize also that if I'd been a little more clever, I would have done a word cloud slide. But being completely technologically challenged, I wouldn't have known how to make the slides, the words be at angles, sort of floating. They would have looked like a grid. So I didn't try. Anyway, but what would have been on the word cloud was beadwork, flying women, wampum, imagination, and monsters. So <laughs> my, my, I suppose uh, another way to, to, to say what this little slideshow um, will, will hopefully show is my sense that we're always in dialogue with the past, that art history um, promotes a linear, a linear trajectory through the past. And most of our museums try to go chronologically through, that your work so stimulates me to, think, to try to think about um, other, other, uh, di other temporal dynamics. And, your question that you started with, I hope we, that's what we can get to after this little brief selection um, about whether we can imagine the future. Uh, how did you put it again? Well, if, if, the act of oh, yeah. if the act of imagining the future yeah. can create it. Can create it, that's right. So there's that question in the background of all of this. So um, this first slide really sets that up because I'm, I'm taking your avatar in uh, Return of the Peacemaker and putting her next to one of the most famous historical figures in Haudenosaunee history, who was a Tus uh, Seneca woman, uh, Caroline Parker, who um, was the, she worked closely with Lewis Henry Morgan, who's regarded as the founder of American anthropology. And her clothing, which uh, she made for him and for his collection, and which he then uh, had someone draw and he published in his, his ethnographies, has become, um, through a long sort of process, um, a kind of canonical style of longhouse dress. So if we look at this famous um, daguerreotype of her, you see that she's wearing a beautiful skirt, which she made. Um, I'm just gonna go forward and show you that. And especially just watching your second machinima, where you had imagined the tree in a futuristic scenario in the sky world, one of the things that struck me so much as a kind of dialogic you know, relationship is when you look at the way Caroline Parker imagined the world tree in the corner of her skirt, because the beadwork on a Haudenosaunee woman's skirt worn in ritual and ceremonial context represents the sky domes that Skowinati has drawn for us in virtual space. Uh, that line uh, of, of dome-like shapes, the world tree projecting up from the top, and then she's made this extraordinary blossoming of this tree in the corner. I mean, that's a, a 19th century, I think, woman imagining this cosmic world of, of peace and, and harmony that you are imagining for us as well. So I'm gonna go back, that's back, it was back. Yeah, so anyway, just to go back to my sense that as an art historian, my training is to go back to the earliest things that we can find. You know, where does Mohawk art begin that we know of? And we know we don't know very much from prior to the, seven, to the 18th century. But I just thought you might like to see this, this little group of things which are in Deerfield, Massachusetts in the Pecumtuck Valley Historical Association Museum, which we think uh, and this is the research of the curator, Suzanne Flint, we have documentation that a uh, minister and his family were captured in a raid of Ganawage Mohawk and French allies, and they went down to New England several times in the 18th century and raided the Western Massachusetts frontier villages and took captives back for ransom. And one of the captives, the daughter of this minister, married a Mohawk man and decided to stay at Ganawage, and her descendants are there now. But they regarded their, um, when the, the rest of the family was ransomed and returned to Deerfield, the, um, they, they several times visited this woman and her Mohawk husband, whose name since, seems to have been Aronson or something that they wrote down that way, visited several times and left gifts. And these are probably the gifts. So the really intriguing question that comes to mind 
is, if these were gifts left by a woman who had married a Mohawk man and had been living in Kahnawake for several decades, probably by this point, did she make them? And are they Mohawk? Of course they're Mohawk. But they may have been made by a white captive. I can't, it's hard for me. I act, actually asked this question of a colleague of mine, Gaonde Horn Miller from Kahnawake, who, to see what, what she thought just recently. You know, would it be likely that she would have left gifts made by someone else? Well, maybe, but it, it's a, it raises some really interesting questions about how we define race, and I'll just leave it there and move on with my slides. <laughs> so, um, so then I've been very interested from the time I first started looking at museum collections, searching out this old material, that most of what I saw was not old or that couldn't be identified securely with any particular First Nation because the documentation is so bad. But I kept finding very, very beautiful examples of beadwork made for sale. And these would be Seneca uh, bags made for sale probably in the tourist market, maybe at Niagara Falls, um, mid-19th century. In many of, this, of these examples, when I look at them, I see celestial visions of, again, an that's the sort of factor of imagination, again, that women in making beadwork of a sort which was for long years dismissed as inauthentic because it was made for sale and all that, actually there are acts of imagination and of a sort of what anthropologists like to call out of body voyaging which you're doing in virtual space. But um, some of the, of the work was also, and just, just to make the point again, that women were extremely good at adapting what they did to the world they were living in, as you are, again. Um, this is obviously a Victorian lady's handbag, but it has um, a Haudenosaunee beadwork in another style, roughly the same period, maybe a different First Nation, different Haudenosaunee nation. Um, of, again, uh, beings that are very significant in, in the ritual life, I believe, of the Longhouse. So then I want to leap forward to other ways in which these worlds that you have shown us so vibrantly are imagined by contemporary artists, contemporary Mohawk artists, again, I'm sticking to that sort of um, tradition. Um, this is work by Shelley Nero, who is a Mohawk artist from the Six Nations uh, for, uh, community uh, west of Toronto. Um, you can see that. Uh, and I was again struck, and I think there's something you showed us in the paper dolls, I think, or the virtual paper dolls. When Shelley made this work, we uh, had an exhibition at the McCord Museum in the 90s, which um, was an exhibition about Haudenosaunee beadwork traditions. And we commissioned two contemporary artists to make responses to it. And this was Shelley's response. It's called Thinking Caps. And it's in the National Gallery of Canada now. She imagined beaded caps that honored four stages of a woman's life, the child, the young woman, the mature woman, and the elder. And the two caps that I've sort of highlighted there in the lower part of the slide are the cap made for the child and for the older woman. And she purposely used aviator's caps, the style of an aviator's hat, for, which is not a traditional Haudenosaunee hat style. So again, you know, it, it's this play of imagination, this, but this constant theme of women traveling in the air. <laughs> so I'll show you another series that Shelley did called Flying Women, um, which is a photo, she's a photographic artist, and these are uh, two, three examples from the Flying Women series where she imagines this, these wonderful bodies in, in flight but she also imagines them in symmetrical, you know, prism-like compositions, and one of which incorporates some of the beadwork motifs from the kind of beadwork that Caroline Parker would have done in the 19th century. So again, the play of temporalities. And um, I want to, I think, have one more little sequence to show you, which I think we talked about a little, and I'm glad you mentioned the cornhusk dolls, because um, one of the most famous uh, sacred or ceremonial wampums of the Haudenosaunee is the circle wampum. And a wampum, if I may be so bold as to try and explain this very important form, which you have also been making, is um, made of uh, an item that's made out of shell beads, um, which the peacemaker used, introduced into Haudenosaunee life as a way of healing violence and healing harm. 
and they have been made in different forms. The, the circle wampum, uh, which I'm showing you for a purpose, actually is a kind of chart of the Haudenosaunee political configuration of the Confederacy chiefs. Each strand of this, the inward pointing strands, represents one of the 50 Confederacy chiefs. Um, and the reason I showed you that first, I'll show you some others in a moment, is that another way of imagining the same sort of things that you've done it, in, in the contemporary moment is an extraordinary installation made by Shelley Nero's sister, Elizabeth Dockstader, who also lives at Six Nations. As you can probably tell from the slide, it's a very large installation of corn husk dolls in which the um, 50 Confederacy chiefs are represented on the inner ring, the great tree in the center, and the outer ring are the clan mothers who guard the chiefs. And she, uh, Elizabeth Dockstader has been quoted, she's, she stated that she took some poetic license in putting them as the outer ring, as the women who guard the men. Because one of the things that's happened in under colonialism all over North America is that the patriarchal and patrilineal systems of Western colonial nations have been imposed on indigenous people. And there, ha there is, I think if there's a, a great sort of um, focus on women, as you have done and as, sh as these artists do, it's an attempt to restore the balance that has been destroyed by this colonial legal imposition that has um, done a great deal of damage. Those are just a couple of examples of the, of the again, the, re, the way in which these motifs are maintained in, in very different contexts in the skirt of the, uh, of the woman's skirt. And um, almost the end. Um, to go back to wampum and to go back to your remaking, wampum in addition to this, the circle wampum is I think a unique example of wampum being configured that way. Um, more traditionally pre-contact, as far as I understand it, wampum was used in strings, uh, in ritual uh, forms to send messages and to record uh, agreements, and possibly also in woven belts, although the real flowering of the belts came after contact when it became possible to get great quantities of these shell beads, which are very laborious to make with uh, pre-industrial tools. So in the early contact period in New York and, and on Long Island, there were little factories to manufacture wampum beads, which were greatly desired and, and facilitated the fur trade. But then you also had this great flowering of an intercultural form, which was needed for Europeans and indigenous people and indigenous uh, First Nations amongst themselves to create agreements and alliances and to remember and record those things. But in the installation of uh, The Peacemaker Returns, which you only saw a very small p part of, you have made wampum belts. And the one in the bottom there, I'm sorry for my bad slide, I took it, a, it's against an illuminated screen, so it's hard to photograph, but it looks much better in the, in the, in the cinema. Um, and you told me that it was called the Intergalactic Empowerment, Empowerment Wampum. So I got it a bit wrong, uh, which, is made in the 23rd, 24th century. Is that right? 23, 25 or something? 3,000. 3,000. Oh, yeah. got it wrong. Okay. In the future. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's... Oh, yeah, no, I one more. This is for you. Yeah. So watching The Peacemaker Returns, and you saw very briefly in the clip these imagined beings from other planets that come together to make peace, and they're imagined in, in these monstrous forms. And um, that's a little slide that I found online, but I wanted to show you this kind of uh, <coughs> because it's not a very well-known piece. It's a box which was painted uh, by a, an artist who lived in uh, the Mohawk territories, the traditional Mohawk territories in New York State in the late 19th century in the period of antiquarian recording of absolutely everything. Um, uh, Grider, his name was, and th there are albums of his drawings of New York State uh, antiquarian things in the New York State Library. And one of the drawings shows this box, which is um, was in the possession of a woman in uh, Kanajahari, one of the Mohawk towns. Uh, uh, and it has these extraordinary imagined beings, which were probably 
underworld, under the earth powers. Um, I think not anyone understands very well what this iconography is, but there is an actual surviving box, which is in a private collection now uh, near Toronto and which was on view at the Art Gallery of Ontario for a period of time, which may, some people think it is that box. I don't because it doesn't have those drawings on the side. And there's a, there's a third one in the Canadian Museum of History that does have drawings on the side. So anyway, the point is that I don't think Rudolf Greider imagined that box. I think this was an aspect of the imaginary in the 18th century, which we've lost. So that's my little, a little bit of a tribute, kind of a, hom a homage to you, you know, of some things that I thought about. But the big question that that's, comes out of it for me is, how do we in the museum world now, because uh, we are speaking with and to curators, um, how how are we, how should we be thinking about these temporalities? in a, an institutional structure which has always privileged the linear chronology from the past to the present and excluded the future, except in the contemporary art section of the museum. So, I don't know, it's a big question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, I think, um, you know, I think humans like to make sense of things. I think that that timeline just helps us to or some people to clarify things, you know? So the thing is, is that when you, when you use that timeline, for example, just one of the structures that we've employed to, to make sense of the craziness that is life, you know, the, you, you lose so much nuance, you know? So I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, like that's a job that has to be done with every single exhibition, right? every single artwork or, you know, when we put our minds to this, we can think of ways of doing it, you know, but it's experimentation and iteration that we, that's how we're gonna make it happen, you know, because I think that, I do think, you know, I really believe that we, as, a, as humans and as, and, uh, you know, the inhabitants of this planet, all of us, the non-human relations as well, we're always, progressing, and I, I use that word because I don't have a big enough vocabulary, vocabulary to think of a better one, because progress has all the, the word progress has all these connotations of, has all these negative connotations, right? Yeah. But I think that we, nonetheless, I do think we are progressing, because I think that we are, we are capable of so much more, We're, meaning not, we don't need the simple timeline anymore. We are capable of holding in our minds the nuance of what we really are, you know? And so I think that that's, that is your jobs and my job is to, we, we reflect society, we reflect who we are now. I mean, that's what, at least that's what I think I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, you, because the Return of the Peacemaker was made, as you said, for children. And you're, you've always been, all throughout your work, you've been very concerned with addressing the young, I think, the, the time travelers, because the two, well, I just take it that way, maybe I'm wrong, the time travelers, the two protagonists who keep visiting different times, and they are young people, teenagers, adolescents? No, no, no? They're, they're totally adults. They're adults, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I always saw them as young, but maybe yeah. that's because I'm old. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. when, I, when I make my work, I don't think about uh, the audience. Mm -hmm. I think about, like, I, that, I don't believe that I'm lying to you when I say that. I, I really think I'm, like, sort of trying to channel, you know, parts of my own self and, like, what I need to see. So I guess I feel like there's something that compels me to create a, a piece or to tell a story, and I know I can see it in my mind's eye, and I, I need it to come out. So that's actually what I'm doing. I'm not like, oh, you know, uh, will the curators like it? Or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, or a, a, lot of, a lot of people ask me, like, who's your audience? And I'm like, mm, me. I mean, that's the first audience. And then there is, you know, then I think, oh, what will my, my friends think? And when I say my friends, I mean, like, there's a bunch of them in, in the audience right now. Like, this is my people, like, other indigenous contemporary artists and cultural workers. You know, I really care what they think. 
And then there's my family, my mom especially. <laughs> I'm like, you know, what are they going to think? Am I, you know, because as a Native person, you're often representing, whether you want to or not, you, you tend to like, I think your, your, your people, your family and your, your colleagues uh, are, are saying, you know, they hold you accountable sometimes, and they should. You know, because it's like, you know, what, what you do, people are going to think that that's all of us. So you better do that right, you know. So, I, so in that sense, I, there, is, there is other people, there is an audience in my mind. But yeah, I don't feel that, I actually don't think I'm talking to youth necessarily. Though I do work with youth, I, ca I care deeply about youth because what other thing represents the future better, <laughs> you know, than youth. But um, that's, that's not how I s actually see my work. Okay, I'm glad From to be From my inside. Correct. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean to imply I thought all of it was, but certainly this most recent one, you, you have specifically yes. designed that way, which is yes. great. But, um, so it is in some way then, given what you just said, what you are creating is, is providing something that was absent when you were growing up. That is, you're doing it for you, and in a sense of the responsibility you have to your entire community, both Mohawk and beyond, um, is that because when you were growing up, this you, you felt that it wasn't it was lacking, and that that lack was a problem um, in terms of the representations that were available, uh, imagining yourself. Yeah, I think I guess that's all true. Yeah, context. you know. Yeah. yeah, I just yeah. Yeah. Maybe we I mean, all. I, well, yeah, I just don't, yeah, I don't know if it's like, it seems there's something, there's an aspect to it of like, if I, I, I'm afraid to say, yes, something was missing in my childhood, <laughs> so I'm creating this work yeah. to fill that gap, yeah. you know. Um, I don't, you know, I don't feel, like, I guess maybe the way I'll answer that is to tell my Barbie story. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, you know, I had Barbies as a kid. You know, and they were all blonde, and they were all white, and I didn't care at all. I loved them. You know, the only problem with them was that they couldn't stand on their own. You know, they would, you had to always hold them, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, it, I, don't, I don't necessarily feel the way that I know other people do feel like, a lot of people feel like when they saw Barbie, you know, oh, she was never brown, or oh, she had really big boobs, you know, and it really made me feel, bad about myself, like, I didn't have that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's not to say that, um, that other people's feelings are invalid. I'm not trying to say that at all. Mm -hmm. I just mean, I just mean that mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't believe that that's where my work is coming from. But I could mm -hmm. be wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't had the therapy yet. <laughs> you have, as you said, we have to say what we, you know, what, what's the truth that we, that we see. So, you know, I, but that actually raises another question, because I think one thing that puzzles me always, especially coming from this academic context that I've been in for quite a while, um, is that in museums you have these many, many different audiences. And you, you, I love that you said that you believe in, we do progress in some sense, because we have to believe that or you have to jump off the next cliff, you know. It, I agree with you. And sometimes I feel like Pollyanna for believing it in the face of all the awful things that go on. but. Um, and by the way, I have to say, I hope you don't mind me letting the cat out of the bag, but at the, in the last section of The Return of the Pre Peacemaker, <laughs> this young uh, woman who returns as the peacemaker goes to visit Donald Trump in the White House and succeeds in, <laughs> in persuading him to abolish injustice in the world. <laughs> so if that isn't optimistic, I don't really know yeah, what it is. It's my story. I can tell, I can say what I want to. <laughs> but... Um, you know, um, every time, since I've been kind of working with these issues and struggling with them for decades and decades now, I'm constantly brought up short by the many people who have never thought about any of it and aren't aware of the exclusions that, uh, you know, indigenous people, but also all sorts of other visible minorities and other groups of people in society who are excluded that you can never stop trying because there's always these, there seem to be always these new audiences who need to hear these messages. And then the issue becomes, do you, are you, do you risk boring the ones who have heard it before by, you know, um, returning to the... I think it's one of the great challenges in, um, 
in the museum world? You know, what level do you go in at? How do you manage yeah. to uh, go in at multiple levels? Yeah, you know, I totally agree, and I, I, I know that's, that's another, uh, exactly, it's like kind of same answer as before, except that I also, I've now realized that we absolutely have to get some of this stuff into the curriculum of, of school children. And so that's sort of a little bit my next, one of my next side jobs that I want to do see that happen. I think I have, a, I have a question, a tough question for you that we didn't talk about before, and so I, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think it's, I want to acknowledge that you're not native, and you know, you've been doing this, all this work in the native world, you know, and I guess, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that that's really tough, you know. I think that uh, maybe when you began back in the day, you know, um, it was less so, I mean, so that's one of the parts of my question for you is like, if you could describe that beginning time, you know, but now, you know, we're finally, we as an indigenous and, you know, all the native type people, you know, we're, we're coming up and we're, we're partially following in some of your footsteps and partially creating our own paths, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's so, one of the, I actually, at one point in my life, was writing a little bit, and so I wrote this essay called um, Five Suggestions for Better Living. And, you know, in it I talked about um, the fact that, like, we, we, indigenous artists, like, needed non-native curators to champion our work, you know, to, to bring us into the institutions where we were not able to get in on our own, you know? And so I just want to, I want to say thank you for doing that, you know? Yeah, but I and I but I also want to acknowledge that like, you know, I want to ask you like, are you still, you know, needed? Th thank you for putting the tough question. You know, if there, if we can't talk about it, these things, what's the point? You know, really, it is a huge question. And thank you for what you said very much. You know, I I got into this corner of art history, which has really been a, quite a small corner for a long time through my interest in African art, and the way that happened was complete serendipity. My parents worked in West Africa when I was an undergraduate, and I visited them twice, and it was a period of time, still sort of the tail end in the late 60s, when art historians were expected to find something new to do that had never been done before, because we're in this very empirical mode where you had to f unearth the, the artists that had never been studied, or facts about, you know. Anyway, it was, that, that in that sense, the Western canon was becoming a bit exhausted. And here was all this African art I was being exposed to, which all the expatriates in northern Nigeria, where my parents were, were madly buying up. And my mother said to me, you, you're studying art. Can you explain what these things are that the dealers are bringing to our house? And, you know, not only could I, of course, not explain anything, but there wasn't much literature you could look it up in. There were some books by modernist lovers of primitive art, and you know, it was really a very bad literature at that time. I thought, ah, here we are in 1967 when I graduated from university. The civil rights movement was galvanizing everybody. It seemed really important to be able to open a door onto African cultures so that people would expand their horizon a bit. Thought that's what I'm going to do. That that will be socially constructive, and and um, it will, uh, um, you know. And it's a field of art history which hasn't been plowed yet, you know. So there, you could do something new. And I I proceeded to to do that. And then, as I was saying, we moved to Canada. Well, Canada in 1967, there was actually shamefully little interest in anything Af any African Canadian or African traditions. It was almost non-existent. And in order to get a job, it was very clear to me I was going to have to do something that people did want you to do. And at my university, Carleton, Canadian Studies, which started Canadian Studies' first department there, they were very anxious to, to deal with this new Woodland School art and this new, newish Inuit art. And they said, well, you know, we'd like to have someone teach Native art. And I had never had a course in my life. And it wasn't taught in art history. And I hadn't done my degree in England where it certainly wasn't taught. So I had to kind of teach myself. And one way of doing that was going to museum collections, very, very little of which had ever been published. So that was the, the start. There is absolutely no question that as with every other 
area of art history which uh, addresses arts by peoples who have been colonized, marginalized, discriminated against, excluded in all these ways, that, that throughout my work in the field, there have been many challenges from people saying, how can you address these arts? You, don't, you didn't grow up in one of these communities. You don't know what it's really like. You don't have insider knowledge. And in fact, in the indigenous world, by the time I started working in that field, indigenous people had succeeded in protecting their ceremonial life from outside invasive scholars who wanted to come and document it. So I never have been inside a longhouse. And I, one of the things that I realized is, and it's one reason why I look, began looking at the beadwork. One reason was I loved it when I saw it in the museums, but another was that it, it was something that was acceptable to work on because it wasn't in, regarded as invasive. And literally I and my colleague Trudy Nix from the Royal Ontario Museum went to Ganawage right after Oka in uh, 1980, 1990, I think, and went to the cultural center and asked the people who worked there one of whom you told me recently, Shirley Goodleaf, was a relative of yours, um, if working on beadwork would be welcome. And I remember I gave a talk at Carleton and the people that we'd gone to talk to came to hear my talk because they wanted to hear what I was up to. And after that, I guess I passed muster, we did, and they said, yes, this is something we would like you to work on because it's an underappreciated art form. So I'm sorry, I'm telling a long story, but that's my, so I think, as time has moved on, there are many very talented indigenous curators now who are coming into museums and teaching positions. And I think we've reached a point now where rightfully there's, um, you can call it affirmative action or whatever, or a recognition of the former exclusions, where there's probably at the moment not much role for a young person who isn't indigenous to be taking on these jobs. I hope that my own hope is that we can get to a point where we can share our knowledges. That's what our database project is about. Because I think that we all, when we look at, you know, when I look at the Peacemaker Returns or when I look at a museum collection of 19th century things, I will see different things than you will see. And they're both probably valid and valuable. and. The, we live in this diverse society. If we don't share these perspectives, we really are lost. So I hope we don't get to the point where we can't have roles to play in institutions that allow us to do, you know, to share in that way. I think Long there was answer. A, there was Sorry, a double negative at the end there that threw me, but yeah. no, I think that I, I loved your answer. I just, I don't agree with one part, which is I do think there is still place for non-native curators to maybe not the job that you have, mm -hmm. you know, and it's true, like maybe not the job that some people I know now have. But I, I think that it would be such a loss to think for like a non-native person to be like, I can't touch that. You know, like I don't, I don't want that. I don't think other mm -hmm. native artists would want that, you know. And that's also what I, I said too in in that same article, you know, and it's, and it's a two-way street, right? It's also like, I think there was a time when Native people were like, you, wouldn't, you don't understand what I do, you know, and I don't, and you can't get it, <laughs> you know? And I think that was like, not really, I think maybe there was a need for it at the time, but I don't think that that's true anymore. Mm. I think now it's like, yeah, dialogue is crucial. And you know, and you have, you, Ruth Phillips, you know, have so much experience and knowledge, you know, and so it's really important, uh, yeah, that you, you pass that on and you, you share it, yeah. Thank you very, very mm -hmm. much. And you know, I, I'm reminded in this, this is gonna be very familiar, I think, to many people in the audience here is that we've been following the controversy around the Brooklyn Museum's recent appointments of their African curator and the, um, uh, do you know about this, Kawanadi? I'll say it and someone can correct me if I got it all wrong, but um, the Brooklyn Museum appointed two curators, one of photography and one of African, the African art collections. And the Africanist they appointed is a white woman. And there was a hue and cry, there is a hue and cry about that appointment. And um, 
I have been working in recent years on this project that Krista kindly mentioned, a multiple modernisms project with Chika Okeke Agulu, who's a Nigerian art historian, teaches at Princeton, and was the, the supervisor of this, um, of this appointee. And he wrote a column which I was very moved by and struck by, in which he tried to, because people have been making connections to the movie Black Panther, where there's a scene where uh, you know, the museum's possession of African art is challenged by a black visitor to the museum. And he tries to make a distinction between, I think he calls it expertise and possession. That is to say, there's some line I wish, I think I need to memorize this because it so me meant so much to me, is that he says something about people who have made a, a, a really serious effort to gain expertise by truly opening themselves or trying to open themselves to other ways of thinking, which is what anthropologists do, what's, what art historians do when they look at other periods and places in art history. If you're a historian of Chinese art or South Asian art or medieval European art or ancient Roman art, you have to open yourself to other worlds. That's what the whole project is. That if we didn't believe we could gain at least enough expertise to make a contribution, we, we couldn't do art history unless we only were you know, we're looking at, I'd have to look at Eastern European Jewish visual art, which wouldn't get me very far. So, you know, um, it, you know it, it's, um, it, it can't be that way. We, we would all, so I, I think that what Chica says about expertise, if we can recognize it, we have to believe it's possible. And, you know, the other buzz that's been going on is the recent appointment at Harvard of a curator of a Southern Renaissance art, and she is a Anishinaabe woman. So, you know, that's the world that I hope we, but I think we also, I also have to say that we have to have humility if we are, particularly if we come from outside of culture, because it's this project that was mentioned, this Great Lakes Research Alliance, and working with um, the very generous indigenous colleagues who have visited museum collections with me and other people, it has completely changed the way I understand a lot of the things that I look at. I never understood the things in museum collections which were presented as gifts and the fact that they were diplomatic gifts in many cases which were intended to solidify cross-cultural relationships. So, you know, I mean, it's just a, I learned that from this dialogue. So the dialogue absolutely has to be kept open. And I appreciate what you said so much for that reason. Can I ask you then a question? It's my $64,000 question. So, you know, I showed you a few of these little things that I found poking around museum collections. Is this consciousness of the historical trajectory of Mohawk art of value to you in some way, to sort of looking into the past? And how do you see those things? Or what, what do they do to enrich in some way your visual universe, if they do? Well, if I... I hope I'm answering your question, but I totally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I keep saying that I want to envision the future, and the first thing I seem to do is turn and look to the past. You know, I, I, I go to my history, and, uh, and so, yeah, you know, I, I'm, and I'm super in love with the material culture uh, of the Haudenosaunee, and think about it all the time. There's this amazing uh, thinker, Seneca man named John Mohawk, and um, I'm not even sure if this fits in with what, what we're just talking about, but it just came to me. Like He, he said this amazing thing about, uh, this is in the preface of this, uh, I'm going to forget the name, so I won't say it, the, this, but the sort of the oldest written account of the creation story. And he talks about how uh, in pre-contact Iroquois, just like today, every child knows who Santa Claus is. In pre-contact Iroquois, everybody knew who Sky Woman was. You know? And so to me, that, evoked, that was just like, when you talk about the flying women, you know, and you talk about like, how you see these things in uh, the beadwork, I'm sure it's there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that uh, that's one of the worldviews that is like maybe getting a little bit lost. I think it is still there, and we're finding it back too. 
And, we're, and it comes back through communication once again, right? But this idea that we come from the stars and that the Earth is just one place in a vast universe, I think that that is part of our cosmology and part of our, our memory and our history. Yeah. So, you know, when I, um, when I made the world in She Falls for Ages and I made those dome-like houses, I did that because I was, I was trying to imagine Sky Woman, okay, she's pregnant, she's going to give birth to a daughter, they're going to populate the, the planet, and they're going to, their, their descendants are eventually going to make that skirt yeah. that you showed. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, why would they make those, you know? Well, Sky Woman was talking about her home, and the homes were her domes. <laughs> so that's why I did those dome-like houses, so that because it would make sense that later on in the future slash our past, they would have the domes on their skirts and the sky and the celestial tree. But that, you know, that also just brings me back again to this uh, thing I keep puzzling over. I think we talked a little bit about it when I came to visit you is this notion of time is cyclical. You know, um, I actually have this piece of paper here because there's a very important statement that I would have to read in order to, you know, one thing we're all grappling with in Canada now is the um, report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on uh, re Indian residential schools or indigenous residential schools, which uh, ends with uh, 94 calls to action. That is 94 things that can Canadians in their various institutions should do now in response. And the one about museums <laughs> is number 67. And it says, we call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Museums Association to undertake in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples a national review of museum policies and best practices to determine the level of compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to make recommendations. So effectively, they're referring back to UNDRIP, to this declaration. If you read that, and it's online, you will see that it requires that we respect not only, um, it, it has provisions for repatriation in a material sense, but it also demands respect for indigenous understandings, indigenous knowledge in, you know, in, in various uh, articles in it. And so we had this little conversation about the way in which, and certainly for the Mohawk who have been interacting with Europeans and other people from other parts of the world for 500 years, 400 years, you know, very long time. Um, 2000. Yeah, <laughs> 2000, <laughs> right. That we have, we can't recover any kind of pure worldview that is unaffected by that interaction on either side. So when I sort of say well, I'm interested in these horizons of temporality, like, I understand the notion of the return of the peacemaker as a, almost like a Jewish messianic vision where we think that the, you know, that the Messiah will still come, or if you're a religious person, you do. And the notion of, of the last judgment of the, you know, there are very, many world religions have this sense of that history isn't finished, but it will in some way, uh, you know, uh, go through these cycles of return. And that, to me has a great deal to do with this melding of these temp the future, past and present horizons. But on the other hand, we're, s we're so influenced by each other, the question is can we find in that a common sense of horizon? And, or is there this thing called indigenous knowledge which is quite separate and different and which many people are very actively trying to promote now in response to the UNDRIP? I mean, to what well, extent is it a hybrid? The, the answer is too long. Yeah. We cannot, we cannot, we do not have time for that answer right now. Okay. But it's mostly yes. <laughs> I think. Okay. Yeah. I think we're, we're getting the hook, the, the okay. hook. Okay, yeah, come well on that off. might, yeah. it's a wonderful place to end then. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Do we,